Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are very happy to have uh, Nima Lashkari from Purdue University to tell us about his work on renormalization and the error correction. Uh, please take it away, Nima. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to speak here, and I hope sometime soon I get to see you guys in person. But, um, well, for now, we, we stick with virtual seminars. So today I'll be talking about renormalization and error correction. And this is based on uh, two papers that I wrote, one with uh, my uh, amazing students, Keichiro Furuya and Shoy Yusef from back in December 2020. And then a more recent paper with Keichiro and a postdoc that recently joined our group, uh, Modesty Musa. All right, please feel free to stop me at any point because the, I, I, uh, I would, it would be nicer if we sort of have a discussion uh, as we go along. So let me start by motivating the problem this way. There is a principle of locality in physics that we care a lot about as physicists. And one uh, aspect of the principle of locality is that to, if, we have, if we look at our many body quantum system, a time slice of our system, there are subregions, and to each subregion, we associate the algebras. These are algebras of observables, fields, or whatever you might want to call them. Now, one aspect of principle of locality is that the, if A is inside AB, the algebra of A is a subalgebra of AB. So we have an inclusion of algebras. But it's not just that, but also the fact that the identity operator is shared in this inclusion. So the identity is in A, is in B, in A, B, and all of that. So we have this nested structure of algebras that all share uh, identity. This is one aspect of locality that's very important for physicists. But we can have inclusion of algebras uh, without locality. So let me give you a bunch of examples. One simple way of thinking about a normalization group, very primitive way of thinking about a normalization group is to think about a free field uh, free field theory, and uh, the, the Fox, in the Fox space, we look at the momentum modes that are below a certain cutoff, and we say we're going to consider the subalgebra that sets the momentum modes above uh, the cutoff to one, and we keep the operators, the creation and annihilation operators and their polynomials and uh, for momenta below uh, the cutoff. So this is a subalgebra that includes the identity. And in this particular case, the subalgebra that we construct are long distance operators. You know, they correspond to these long wavelength operators. And it's a subalgebra of the full algebra of all operators. Uh, and we're going to see that this structure will keep repeating uh, in, in the uh, in this story. So this is a sort of a motivating the connection. More generally, more non perturbatively in a normalization group, what we are sort of dealing with is uh, we have an algebra in the Hilbert space. And we, instead of thinking about long range operators, long mom low momentum operators, because momentum and energy are not necessarily always the same thing, we think of low energy observables. So we consider uh, a subalgebra, again, that includes identity. We take a projection to some uh, subspace of lower energies, lower than some cutoff lambda. We project, we do the following projection, we project to these boxes, this low energy uh, box, and then for the rest, we put just identity, right? So this is one minus P, the projection. So of course, this is again, the same structure. We have low energy observables, and this is an inclusion that uh, includes identity. All right. <clears throat> now, I wanna give a last example for, for this list of inclusion of algebras, I, uh, I should say that the, the last two examples do not respect any locality, right? So this is an inclusion of algebras without locality. Now I'm gonna give a third example, which is holography. So um, first let's say there is the bulk algebra, algebra of the bulk and algebra of the boundary for the whole uh, constant time slice. And one way to think about holography, roughly speaking, uh, is to say that the algebra of B could be embedded isometrically inside the algebra of A. So we could think of the algebra of the semi-classical gravity as a sub-algebra of what is the, in the boundary. Now, this is a toy model. 
uh, this total model of holography, of course, but uh, let's just for simplicity think about that because we've, we've learned that this line of this way of thinking about stuff is useful. Now, this inclusion actually could be in holography is combined with that local version of inclusion. So on the boundary, we have this inclusion of uh, algebras due to locality. There is this region that is inside a larger region. And this, there, there is a similar structure in the bulk, and they're all con they're both consistent. So what does that mean? It means that we there is what is it means what we call the subregion subregion duality, right? So there is a region subregion of the boundary theory A, and then there is there is this, there are T surface. Let's just stick with uh, for for the some, for the sake of the argument. Let's stick with time independent states. Um, so there is, this is the RT surface, there is the entanglement wedge. And we think of the algebra within the entanglement wedge as a subalgebra of the boundary. So now we have a structure of net of algebras that sit inside each other on, on the boundary because of locality. We have a similar structure in the bulk. And then there is this inclusion, which is non-local, but it's all consistent, right? So uh, the and the, what, what I want to say is that the yeah so the bulk operators in this entanglement wedge um, are in our sub could be understood as a sub algebra of the boundary operators. Of course, this is an approximate notion, but um, let's 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 go with that. So again, to summarize, we gave a bunch of examples of inclusion of algebras where identity is inside the sub algebra, and the point is this. Every time we have an inclusion of algebra of this form, we have an exact quantum error correction code. This is just like synonymous. It's the same thing. Mathematically, it's the same thing. And this is a quantum error correction code in a Heisenberg picture. So we're, we're going to discuss this. This is not, this should not be surprising, but we'll, we'll, we're going to discuss it to make sure that the point is very clear. Um, one more thing to say, just terminology, in case you're, you hear this word here uh, in different places. There, in this, this business, often people talk about conditional expectations. Conditional expectations are simply projections from this algebra down to the subalgebra. That's all that a conditional expectation is. Of course, it's important that uh, the identity is in the subalgebra. And well, I, 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 it's a positive map. That's, I guess it's a projection that corresponds to a positive map. That's important, but yeah. All right, are there any questions about these simple uh, discussion of inclusion of algebras? So the point is that we want, I wanna say that every time you have such an inclusion, you have an exact error correction code, quantum error correction code. And furthermore, if you have an approximate inclusion of al an, uh, an algebra, you get an, an approximate error correction code. Okay. So let's see what are these error correction codes we are talking about. So in the case of the case of that we discussed due to locality, this is just a simple, very very simple trivial error correction code. Your Hilbert space, and if you're in a lattice, splits into the Hilbert space of A, tensor the Hilbert space of B. And if you encode your information in the Hilbert space of A, errors do not disturb the errors occurring on B do not perturb them, do not disturb them, right? Because the errors commute with your information. You'll have to correct for them, but you'll but they still commute. This is the most trivial context. But the point is that every time you have an inclusion of algebra like this, at least in finite quantum systems, up to a unitary, you have this picture. So this unitary rotates the notion of what is, obscures the notion of locality, but there is a notion of locality in some basis hidden inside every quantum error correction code, exact quantum error correction code. So in the case of, if I wanna give another, well, the, the example of the low energy subalgebra, you could just, and say, this is often called the subsystem quantum error correction code. Um, of course, I'm simplifying the story a little bit, but conceptually, this is the, 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 uh, the story. And then 
in the in the low low energy algebra, for example, of RG that we discussed, there is the infrared, and then that's direct sum with the UV. The errors occur in the UV, and you encode your information in the IR. And this is some sort of a something that we could call a subspace quantum error correction code. There is no tensor product structure between the UV modes and the IR modes, but there's a direct sum. They, they still commute. In the example of holography, is it's like a mix of subspace and subsystem uh, quantum error correction code. It's like a, it's, well, I'm gonna, for lack of a better term, I call it a mixed quantum error correction code. Here you had a tensor product, here you had a direct sum, here you have a direct sum of tensor products. So your here is the, um, there is a label Q that corresponds, you can think of them as various chart sectors, if you wish. Um, um, and then there is the, uh, the algebra of uh, the algebra of this region W of A is basically block diagonal with a whole bunch of matrices in here, and then the commutant or, or the, the the stuff that commute with it are sitting outside here. So this is a mix of class. Uh, this is this is a mix of this sub subspace and subsystem uh, quantum error correction code. It's simultaneously encoding classical and quantum. Uh, information. All right. Any questions about here? Yeah, I have a question. So there is also some uh, algebra or some algebra elements that lives on the boundary of um, the entanglement wedge, I suppose, and that will be categorized into W of A or the rest part, or that's ambiguous. Yeah, so very good. So the, the algebra that corresponds to that, so let me just give a, a rough picture. Roughly speaking, in this simple picture that I'm advocating, the algebra that sits on this RT surface is in the center, right? It's in the center, it's central. It commutes with all this stuff in W of A, right? And that means that it basically corresponds to the following thing. Some lambda of Q, identity of Q, tensor, identity, Q, rest. So this is the, this, uh, this sub-algebra that I showed you has a, has a center. So let me actually, let me be a little bit more clear. So the sub-algebra has the following form, right? And then this sub-algebra, this is the bulk algebra, has a center in this form. Right, these are blocks of this is this block diagonal, and then you put various uh, coefficients on the these blocks, and that's the center. And then this is the thing that is roughly speaking playing the role of this center of the algebra that I'm just wanna qualitatively associate it to the um, the um, RT surface. Okay, I see. So because this RT is like some fixed uh, uh, point or yeah. Fixed this Mm -hmm. Right. I, I'm working at the level of actually the, the level that is discussed in Harlow's 2017 paper. So I'm not I'm not talking about yet talking about, you know, uh, I, I'm happy to explain or comment on that at the end. But at, at this point, I'm motivating the problem and I'm not discussing the distinction between the reconstructable wedge versus uh, entanglement wedge. Right. So I'm just pretending there's a code subspace and the reconstruction could be done for all operators. Because we, we are in the context of exact error correction. That context comes up when you talk about approximate error correction. But yeah, we will we'll, we'll hope, well, maybe not in this talk, but that, that's definitely the direction that I'm happy to discuss and talk about. Great. Any other questions? Um, uh, I had a question on, so on this uh, RG, low energy. Um, if you had some sort of UV IR mixing, uh, what would that imply for the subalgebras? Well, if the mixing is small, then you would say you have an approximate uh, quantum error correction code. In some, and then we have to clarify what we mean by small, right? But then, then there are theorems you could prove quantum error, and we're going to discuss this. We're going to prove such examples of such theorems. But if the mixing is strong, you would say you don't have a renormalizable theory, right? If the UV and IR mixing is large, you can't renormalize the theory. So you just you can renormalize a theory when you, there is a there is some sort of a separation between scales. A theory is renormalizable if the UV modes and the IR modes almost decouple. 
So can you relate the mixing between the UV and the IR to the fidelity of a quantum error correcting code? Absolutely. Uh, that, that's going to be the point. Yes. Okay. Cool. Uh, you're, you're seeing in advance where I'm going. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about renormalization group and quantum error correction at a little bit more detail. So for at least high energy theorists or maybe condensed matter theorists, renormalization and quantum error correction have had a long history in the sense uh, together. So we, we in high energy, at least, when we talk about renormalization group, you often have in mind some sort of a UV CFD or quantum field theory that's um, UV finite. Then we deform it by turning on some relevant deformation. And then this flows towards some endpoint. Now, in, in um, on a lattice and condensed matter, the situation is a little bit different, but still the, the picture is somewhat similar, right? In the UV, you usually don't have a UV CFD in, in condensed matter, but anyway. Now, every time, there are various endpoints imaginable for uh, uh, an RG flow, but um, every time you have degenerate vacua, right? In the deep in the infrared, when you reach the ground state, you have degenerate vacuum, um, you have error correction code, codes. This is basically the message. You can get degenerate vacuum due to spontaneous symmetry breaking of discrete or continuous groups. And we're gonna see that this is a this is like a classical error correction code. It's nothing surprising. If you, you can have symmetry protected topological uh, things, which are edge modes, I will not discuss this in this talk at all. And then you can have topological order, which is a quantum error correction code. So these, these two, I'll, I'll give an example from here and an example from here. But error correction and degenerate vacua are always sort of related, um, have been related, right? So when you have spontaneous symmetry breaking, you have classical, and if you have topological order, you have quantum error correction code. So how does this work? The connection works. The, the simplest setup for spontaneous symmetry breaking, you can consider a 1D Ising model and uh, the ground state, uh, in the degenerate vacuum have, uh, there, there are two, the, there are two, uh, the vacuum manifold is uh, two-fold degenerate. There's all up, all down manifold. And um, basically you can view these as the repetition code, right? If you if some error occurs locally and flips one of these guys, you can detect and correct for it. Why can you do that? This is a classical code. The reason we can do that is that you have encoded your information in the infrared degrees of freedom. And these infrared degrees of freedom are have long range order. Now, um, in the topological, in the case that the system is topological, for example, the quantum Kitas uh, double model or Tora code, you have a subspace of vacuum. You put the system, for example, on a torus, and uh, you have these um, you have vacuum degeneracies that had to do with non-contractible loops. Um, and then if lo some local error occurs, again, you could detect and correct for them. So the point, the, the message, the principle behind this appearance of error correction code is that when you look at the vacuum subspace, this degenerate vacuum subspace, going from one code state to another code state involves acting in a macroscopic region. This is why we have error correction codes. Now, uh, if you, if, if um, this, pre this principle continues to hold in low energies, approximately, because you still have long range uh, correlations, right? So you, the, the, the low energy states are, to, to make a low energy excitation of the vacuum, you expect that to require a long range or acting on a macroscopic number of sites, just intuitively. That's why this is the intuition or logic behind why this vacuum degeneracy story extends to the case where the vacuum is unique, but we're discussing the approximate error correction code, classical or quantum, in the low energy states of general quantum system. So we don't need topological order or symmetry breaking anymore, but there is an approximate error correction code in pretty much any RG flow, uh, as long as there are some basics of uh, basic properties that are expected to hold in many uh, physical systems. All right, any questions about this part?
All right, let's motivate this a little bit more with a specific example. So the example is going to be classical and I'll try to be explicit about how, how the error correction works. So we're gonna think of classical RG as approximate error correction code. Um, and the simplest setup for RG that I know of is classical 1D Ising model, nearest neighbor Hamiltonian. And we're gonna, because we're in classical physics, we're gonna stick to the thermal state. So there is, um, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna do coarse graining, for example, uh, like Kadanoff's uh, spin blocking. So you have the algebra of the UV, for example, at one step you have nine sites, and then one step in the infrared, you have three sites. And you have a map that sends the states of three sites to a single collective degree of freedom. I'll use the quantum notation, but the problem is classical. The quantum notation is just helpful. So here are the spin degrees of freedom at one level uh, deeper in the UV, and then these are S prime is the degrees of freedom in one level in the IR. A simple way, <clears throat> sorry, a simple way for to do this three to one coarse graining is the majority vote. So we have a state of these three spins, uh, and you want to send it to S prime. A simple, you know, majority vote. You could think of it as some sort of a linear map that sends this um, eight dimensional. Uh, Hilbert space to do to this two-dimensional uh, Hilbert space, right? So this is that linear map and going the opposite way, the transpose of this map is the encoding map that encodes the infrared operators in the uh, UV, right? So this is the encoding of the information in the UV. So in the connection that we're gonna discuss between error correction and RG, uh, keep in mind the infrared degrees of freedom are logical stuff. You encode them in the UV and you're protected against the local UV noise. This is the correction. Now you could replace all these with approximate. Um, now this is the encoding and then this the encoding is the T transpose. Now, how do you model an error in this case? A simple example of an error is a classical, uh, a, 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 sorry, a, a, it's a classical channel, which is the uh, binary uh, uh, bit flip. So with probability of P, the bit flips at some site, right? And then I'm making a binary uh, so that it's a, it's a channel, it's a conditional expectation, it has a conditional uh, probability. So with probability P, this guy flips. All right, so this is an operator here, and I want to renormalize it, push it towards the infrared. Right, renormalization of this is pushing it to the infrared, which means that so this is the error that occurs here on the second bit, for example, and then I act on identity identity here. T T transpose on the right and T on the left will be pushing this map up. So if you do this simple, very very simple calculation, you find that the error on the next level is exactly like the error here, but the probability of error has become weaker by factor of two. So um, the renormalization of the lo local operator after many, after many, many layers will make the error exponentially weaker as you go to the infrared. Now, there is a very simple way to talk about this in the language of channels. You say that this is a channel and it's a channel. Uh, this this operator is well. Okay, maybe 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 I should not, I should not. Um, do that. Are there any questions about this example? This is the basic basic principle underlying the whole connection. One thing to notice is that, based on the argument I gave you, the UV errors as you go to the deep in the infrared, they become exponentially weaker, which means that. If you go deep enough in the infrared, you don't even need to correct for them. So this approximate error correction code is somewhat passive. You don't need to correct for them. They just disappear. Errors, they are, this is the physicist intuition of relevant versus irrelevant mode. So the intuition, this is what, what this is building in, is that irrelevant, uh, the vast majority of, uh, well, short distance local UV operations are irrelevant. So they will disappear in the infrared but now we're giving it some sort of a coding of uh, error correction. Are there any questions? Yes, I have a question. So I don't understand why you call this two by two matrix to be the renormalization of the 
local operator G. It looks to me that you go from the IR to the UV by using this uh, T transpose, and then you flip one of the spins, right? And then you go back to the IR part. So the, the error map in the UV is, is uh, this bit flip guy, which it means that if you are in, it sends zero to one with probability, oh, sorry. P. It sends zero to one and one to zero with probability P, and then probability one minus P keeps them the same, right? Right. It's a binary, right. symmetric binary channel. It's a classical channel. And this is a channel that occurs here and distorts the state. I just map this channel one step up and see under the, what, how, the, the, this channel runs, this channel runs. Uh, the, this error propagated, uh, this error that as it propagates to the infrared, and then you, you can, th this is how it runs. The renormalization of this error channel is this, and then in the infrared, it is described by the same error, same type of error, same symmetric binary channel, but a weaker probability, smaller probability for the flip. Right, I think I understand the, that you flip the, the spin in the UV regime. And uh, yeah, then you use T to go to the IR part, right? But, but somehow it's, it's, you still have a T transpose at the beginning to go from uh, the IR to the UV first, if I understand yeah. correctly. Yes. And then you go back to IR. It's like, a, right? Do, do I understand correctly? You, you go to so the- So this is, this, is, this is some noise that acts on the infrared because it's a map. So what is the domain of T transpose? It's infrared. So T transpose, this thing T is a map from infrared to infrared. Right, right, right. That, that's what I understood. Uh, but, okay, so you're saying it's a renormalization of local operator of G. Okay, so basically, you, okay, now I understand because G is in the UV and then you say I define uh, an operator and at the IV, uh, in the IR, but using this G in the UV, then you are saying it's the- Yeah, just blow this up. I just see. blow this up. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Oh, well, I have a question. Yes. So in, in this example, I think you are, uh, thinking about a block spin transformation. Uh, for example, if you consider a Wilsonian renormalization group, then it uh, acts on the theory rather than a state. So how is it related to quantum error? Oh, okay. So yeah, the, the, that, that story is a little bit more complicated. Let's, let's just for now stick to uh, this example as Kadanoff spin blocking. Right. So the, the connection with the theory is that, uh, you know, um, we start with the thermal state under this map. Thermal state is as you move the state upwards, uh, it, run, it runs. Now, because it's a thermal state and you would like to still interpret as a thermal state in the infrared, your Hamil the corresponding Hamiltonian to that thermal state runs. But let's, let's not get into those complexities for now. I all I just want to, all, all I'm saying is that what, what we're discussing is uh, renormalization as Kadanoff spin blocking done to states, right? There's a particular coarse graining algorithms, and then we're we're coarse graining states, and then we're looking at how uh, how errors propagate. This is the shortest okay. route uh -huh. to the well, yeah. There are, there are many contexts for uh, RG, but I'm I'm let, let's just for simplicity stick with this. Okay, thanks. Sure. Now, in the next step, let's make this example quantum. So the closest I know to what, what is it to do spin blocking quantum mechanically is basically um, something like tensor network renormalization, entanglement renormalization. And if I want to be able to run all the way to the infrared arbitrarily without a mass gap, then I should be talking about scale invariant systems. 
And the simplest setup to, for, for, to discuss that is this MIRA, multi-scale renormalization assets. So uh, I take the point of view, I'm taking the point of view that uh, MIRA is the quantum generalization of this simple Cadenop spin blocking that I was talking. By the way, the discussion on this side is going to be uh, mostly based on the work of Kim and Castoriana in 2017. So quantum analog of spin blocking is MIRA. And in MIRA, your core screening map, well, here, here I, sh I should say that T transpose is an isometry that encodes, it's an encoding isometry. Here, you still have an encoding isometry. You call it W or W dagger, usually. W goes up and W dagger is encoding go that comes down. Uh, but this, co so W is a co-isometry. Now, this W is no longer just one step thing. It is it's comprised of two steps. One of them does the co coarse graining, and the other one is the unitary step that disentangle the disentangler and the UV modes. So because of it's a mechanical system, you have to deal with entanglement. It's a two-step process, but it doesn't really matter for us because at the end of the day, we're just going to look at one, one encoding step, which is one, uh, uh, one isometry, W dagger. Now, the same story uh, goes through. You, if you have an operator in the UV, if you want to push it up, you will have to look at W dagger or UVW. That's the, how this operator is renormalized. This is the operator renormalization. Now, in the context of Mira, this is often called the scaling super operator. And uh, the point is that the, as a, if you view, this is a quantum channel. So I'm, I'm telling you in advance that an intuition behind this. This is a quantum channel and the eigen operators. The eigenvalue, there are eigen operators for this quantum channel. The eigenvalues of this are always, because it's a quantum channel, have to norm less than one. Now, less equal to one. Now, for the cases where the norm is less than one, sorry, uh, yeah, okay. So maybe, maybe, maybe I should say it a little bit differently. So this is a quantum channel that does renormalization. So it's a scaling operator. The eigen operators of the scaling operator are the conformal primaries. These are the scaling operators. And the eigen value is always less equal than one. And that's just because of the fact that this is a quantum channel. That just follows from the fact that these are isometries. Now, there is another, this, this fact that this guy is less than one is familiar to physicists. Log minus log of this is what we call the conformal dimension. And the conformal dimension has to be non-negative. Right. So when the conformal dimension is zero, those modes are invariant under the RG. They, if you make a perturbation of that type, it survives the RG. Therefore, that noise cannot be corrected. But anything else could be corrected. Now, that, that, that's the whole point. Anything else becomes exponentially weaker as you flow towards the RG, uh, towards the IR. And that exponential, how, and that exponential is basically controlled by the dimension of the lightest primary. So if I take any arbitrary unitary, uh, any arbitrary UV operator, and I apply the channel n times, the norm of the resulting operator is at least uh, has at least shrunk by e to the power of minus n, n being the number of times I apply the channel delta, which is the dimension of the lightest primary. So errors become exponentially weak in the IR. The only caveat to this, what I just told you, is that it's possible that the RG flow will have operators of dimension zero. That is when there are things that mix with your identity. So let's just put that for that that aside. Those are those will lead to all sorts of degeneracies and complications. So for generic RG flow, we we expect that uh, this this RG is uh, we'll, we'll have all that all the eigen operator will have conformal dimensions larger than zero, except for the identity. And uh, that means that all the uh, local perturbations, as you flow to the, towards the infrared, they become exponentially weaker. This was the work of, well, okay, maybe, maybe I should say a little bit more. So this is for local operators. So you could ask, how do non-local operators evolve under the RG? So as Kim and Castoriano observed, um, there are two steps to the evolution of non-local operators in Mira. If your non-local operator is supported on region A, in the first step, 
under your coarse graining, the support of this R operator shrinks. And I'm intentionally drawing these pictures so that you have the analogy with logarithm in mind. So because you're the coarse graining, the support, the number of sites, lattice sites, where the operator is supported as you flow towards the infrared shrink exponentially fast. So after log of A, if A is the linear size of the system, this operator has shrunk to almost a point. At this point, the second stage of RG starts. And the argument I just told you starts applying. So now you have a local operator. There's a quantum channel that applies to it. And the, uh, the, um, the norm of the local operator has to fall off at least exponentially fast with an exponent that's controlled with the lightest primary. So if you go, if you flow by an RG parameter, which is S minus log of A, this coefficient is the coefficient that tells you the suppression of the norm of this operator out here. So uh, yeah, this is what I just said. So the support of a non-local operator shrinks um, and the, it shrinks to a point after log of A and afterwards the, uh, the uh, norm of the operator starts shrinking. This was uh, what Kim and Castoriano argued uh, correctly. And then why is this an approximate error correction code? How is this an approximate error correction code? So let's, in this, in this picture that we're, we're talking about, we're going to take the infrared states here. So these are the infrared states psi r and psi r prime. We take infrared states here. And then we isometrically embed them, map them to the UV, and apply the perturbation to see how the perturbation acts on them. So we will have, this is a UV operator, this is a local UV operator. These are infrared states. We will have a exact error correction if the matrix elements of the UV operator in the um, code, code states, right, is basically diagonal. It's proportional to the projection to the identity operator. We have an exact error correction code. If there are epsilon corrections, we say we have approximate error correction code. So this is the approximate nil of lamp condition. So if we want to do such a calculation, all we can do, all, all we need to do is that, so this is an infrared, these are infrared states, this is a UV operator. We have to track, the, we have to flow this to the infrared and finish the calculation. That's all we have to do. And if we want to prove that there's an approximate error correction code. And this is what, this is what Kim and Castoriana did. And they, they discussed uh, what controls this, these approximations. All right, any questions about this part? Um, yeah, so this uh, flow as you're moving between uh, steps, is this bounded by some sort of light cone behavior? Approximate light cone behavior, yeah, approximate. So it's like, because, a, this is like a Lee Robinson type bound or something? Uh, so, well. Because it's like a lot of systems. Analog, the analog thereof and in, in, in uh, in uh, uh, Mira. So basically what, what it is, is um, if you have, it's hard to draw these Mira diagrams. So if you have um, like N sites in the next level, you have projected to basically, if you, if you in each step of course training, you send two to one, you're projected to almost N plus two. It's not, it's almost N plus two because this, this, division by two doesn't quite apply to the boundary degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. So if you literally track them and draw these pictures of the, the where, where a perturbation expands, it will basically shrink to some order, number order one, like three, four or something. And then at some point it just sticks, it stays at that size, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just because uh, you are, you're discretizing the system. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. I answer the question? Yeah, 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 perfectly. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think these these pictures were. Uh, I, yeah, I think Bra I don't know who drew these first, perhaps Giffray, but I learned them from Brian showing those papers. But yeah. All right. Any other questions before I move on to Simira? I mean, like uh, from this Lee Robinson like behavior, is the log a like optimum?
optimum with respect to uh, like when you're flowing from like n sites to like a single site like what is the maximum depth of the mirror that you need is well, there like an upper bound or like for, a for, what we're saying here is that for any mirror network that has a structure of a course going step and a unitary the number of steps that it takes to flow to or from some large operator of support uh, A to something that's order one is always order log A. Now, okay, yeah, it's yeah. always order log A. Now, <laughs> I don't know about the coefficients and whether it could improve on them or something. We, we yeah. let, let, uh, This is just a sort of like high level. Uh, that, that would actually suffice for our purposes. The fact is order log N is always sufficient. Mm -hmm. OK, cool. Thank you. So next we move on to CMIRA and the model of CMIRA, continuous mirror that I'll discuss is based on, is the one that was, at least I learned from uh, this paper 2019 of Gifford Vidal and friends. And it's a model of massive one plus one D bosons. Um, so um, what, what it does is that um, there's a Hamiltonian. Well, actually, let me, let me actually say what I'm gonna, go over in the remainder of the talk. So in the remainder of the talk, I will go over how this argument, this discussion of Kimmer and Castoriano generalizes nicely to um, the continuous continuous mirror. And there are analogs of that. We'll do explicit calculations and keep track of the errors of how approximate uh, the error correction is. And then if there's time remaining, I'll comment on the relevance of this for holography. And what does this teach us about holography? Because already you can see that these, these pictures look somewhat holographic, just at the same level that Mira looks holographic. So the model is similar that I'll... I'll... Uh, yes. Sorry. Uh, so so, so the, the reason why you, you, you consider Simera like, uh, does it have also to do with uh, the notion of algebra of operators in continuum? You're asking, is that the reason that I'm discussing? Uh, I'm, I'm considering it. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I just wanna. So the 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 idea is uh, we are we are interested in discussing um, understand moving towards holography, and we're interested in moving towards quantum field theory. So um, we would like to move towards the continuum limit. That's why I'm I'm moving towards Simira. Um, okay. And yeah, so. How much of this art, how much of this structure could this structure be an artifact of the uh, artifact of the uh, lattice or is there always such a structure and and the continuum and we're going to explicitly see that there are some subtleties in the continuum limit but the main principle holds and this is hopefully going to shed light on um, on holography as well because holography Okay, <laughs> in holography, we're in this odd situation where if I think about like a, a thermal field double, let's say in the in one plus one dimensional bulk. Here, I'm encoding the algebra, this, this algebra in the bulk, which is a quantum field theory algebra. It's a tricky algebra. It's type three, one fancy stuff. The, I'm encoding this inside a normal quantum mechanical system type one system. It's infinite dimensional, but it's still type one. So we it's actually known that there exists no such uh, isomet, there's no, there exists no such uh, embeddings. So there, there, this is like, it relates to a whole bunch of other questions that have come up recently. There was a paper of Hong Liu and collaborator Edward Ed Witten wrote the paper on this. That it, it, we would like to move towards more realistic models of holography. Start with these toy models and make them more realistic. That's the name of the game. Okay. So in this model of holography, in this model of Simira, we are looking at one plus one dimensional bosons. Here is the uh, Hamiltonian. The, there's del x phi x squared plus the momentum mode field momentum uh, field momentum mode. There is a mass term, and then there is an irrelevant deformation term that is integrable. So the irrelevant deformation term has this form. It's, um, it breaks from Carrier invariance explicitly. And as you flow towards the infrared, where, uh, sorry, flow towards the UV, deep in the UV, this term, <clears throat> 
as you flow towards the uh, UV, this term grows. This term grows and um, it, it messes up your, um, your um, actually, sorry, let me, let me think. Yeah, I think I have a sign mistake here. This should be minus, I believe. Yeah, I have a sign mistake there. So the the convention is such that s going to minus, as as often as typical in Simira, s going to minus infinity corresponds to the cutoff energy scale going to infinity, and then in this language, e to the power of s is the length scale. I've set m equal one. So uh, to to simplify my life, I've set m equal to one. So e to the power of s is a length scale. Um, this is integrable because at any scale e to the power of s, you could define these modified creation and annihilation operators, right? And uh, the, the, these, with respect to these creation and annihilation operators, you could constru construct a Hilbert space at any energy scale. Um, of course, you're going to have a, a unconventional uh, dispersion relation that depends on the scale, but that's what it is. That's the system you're solving. So this the system could be solved exactly as was done by these guys. Now, we would like to look at this as a model of error correction. So we're going to think of the code subspace as the select IR states of the quantum field theory. And I'm going to describe to you how, how these states are defined. But they are basically co coherent states at scale S, which means that they are coherent states defined with respect to the creation and annihilation operators as, at scale s, e to the power of s. And then um, I can encode these states at a point x naught, for example. So I, that's, that's what I'm going to describe. So hopefully it's clear that the code subspace, what, what I mean by the code subspace, these are coherent states of the infrared um, theory. So just one very quick comment on how you encode states in quantum field theory, uh, like for example, p-level system, you could encode the Q-did in using coherent operators in three fields. Um, so uh, this is the coherent operator. If you want the coherent operator at uh, scale S, you pick the creation and annihilation operators at scale S, and then this means the integral, right? This means that you're integrating f of x, a dagger s of x, right? So this is the coherent operator. And if I pick my function f, function f is a complex uh, function in, in general. If I pick it to be some sort of a smooth regularization of the Dirac delta function peak at some x naught with width epsilon, a function like this, this is basically encoding. I'm encoding a quantum system. Uh, I'm encoding a p-level quantum, sorry. I'm encoding a quantum uh, degree of freedom at some point x naught at various scales of the uh, quantum field theory. So um, yeah, I put a p here because I can multiply with this p. And as you can probably see, this p will play a role if I want to make these guys or orthonormal. So you, you, can, you can easily see that uh, different p's are going to correspond to different states at, encoded at this point. And then if you bring two of these guys nearby, they are uh, independent degrees of freedom uh, until epsilons become, you know, their, their width becomes start, they, their distance becomes order epsilon. So this is basically a continuum version of encoding that we do in, on a lattice. So what is the problem of interest? Remember, we're interested in looking at some IR states, so these are defined uh, two different IR states at um, psi R and psi R prime, and then do some sort of a UV perturbation at some point, I don't know, so, something like this. So what we would like to do is you would like to flow this guy to the infrared and write this guy in terms of the AS and AS dagger at scale, at this scale. Right? That's what we like to do, and then check to see if it satisfies the nil Laflamme uh, equation, which is proportional to approximately proportional to del delta R, R prime. So we would like to flow the UV operators. So it turns out that, of course, intentionally we've chosen these UV operators, such these coherent operators, that the renormalization of the coherent operator is another coherent operator, but with a new function. 
So you trade. So here's your original. Uh, here's your original um, UV degrees of uh, coherent operator. As you could rewrite this as an infrared coherent operator, but the function changes. So the function the function changes. Now um, now let me just jump into the answer to, of the, the result of the calculation. The result of the calculation is something like this. So this function f you could split into two parts, f minus and f plus. So this is the real part and imaginary part. The real part is basically uh, the field momentum mode part of the uh, coherent operator. And then this is the uh, uh, field part. And not surprisingly, in a sense, the same picture that um, Kim and Castoriana saw on a lattice is seen here. So as you evolve from the UV to, towards the infrared, for a very long time, the, this function is frozen. Until, for how long? Until e to the power of s becomes comparable to epsilon. So epsilon is the size of perturbation. So as you as you uh, run the RG, the, the the function, the size of the perturbation is frozen. The perturbation function is frozen, but the lattice spacing, the cutoff is changing. The cutoff is growing exponentially. So after you run by an amount which is log of epsilon, now the whole function sits inside a single block, a single unit, a single site of the lattice, right? So this is the phase that's frozen. This is the first stage that uh, Kim and Castoriano observed. In the second stage, as e to the power of s becomes larger than epsilon, these functions start flowing. So for the field momentum modes, they start becoming flatter for, uh, sorry, yeah, for the field modes, they become pointier. And these are precisely the right behavior we expect to get an error correction code uh, in the, uh, as, as described by, as was uh, required by the Neil Laflamme uh, uh, condition. So let me be a little bit more specific. So here are two um, infrared uh, modes. So I've encoded, so here I've encoded at some point X naught and scale E to the power of S, two different states, P and P prime. These are the labels that will tell me which site, which level I am at, at that point. And then I consider a field momentum a coherent a moment a field momentum coherent operator in the UV. And you look at this this guy, you do the calculation. The fact that this, so yeah, you can you can define let, let me just not get too much into the details of the calculation, but the basically the, the, the structure of it is that this is proportional to uh, delta PP prime, delta R R prime, I called it before which is the projection to the, um, the projection to the uh, code subspace. And uh, the, the corrections to that are become smaller and smaller as this function becomes flatter and flatter. And the same holds for the, uh, for the boson, field boson operator. Now, let me actually try to draw some of these uh, pictures with, again, suggestively using the analogy with holography. So what does this say? It says that here I encoded some degree of freedom. This is the UV, this is the infrared. I make a perturbation here. This perturbation first shrinks to a site and then I have to keep it a distance away from that. So if this is the whole thing as S, I have to keep that away from this and this this height this distance tells me how good of an error correction code i have because this tells me how weak this perturbation has become now the same logic holds for region c so i not only i can correct for region a but i can also correct for region c this is the context that was discussed discussed by um uh, preskill and uh pastowski uh, and it's basically local quantum error correction in holography. This is uh, the story that they discuss Uber holography, meaning that you could not only erase this, and also you can also erase this. And you can take this region and keep cutting out 
smaller and smaller regions. So you can work towards building, con constructing something that's called trade-off balance. Yeah, so um, yeah, but let me, let me not get into too much of those details uh, and summarize this discussion, uh, the discussion of this session, th this part in the following way, that we consider one plus one dimensional massive boson, Simira, which is a very explicit irrelevant deformation that's integrable. We encode degrees of freedom here in the infrared and we look at operators in the A and region C, coherent operators, and we observe that these guys approximately do not disturb the error, the, the, the code. And what is a pro what controls this approximation is how far I've flown in the IR. If S, S has to be much larger than log of A over epsilon, right? To just make that, to, to get the error, error correction that I need. Now, are, are there questions so far? So I want to say something about holography here. Um, so how different is this from holography? So it's, this is different from holography in uh, two ways. So first, so what does this teach us about holography? We just saw approximate error correction for any uh, quantum system, right? Uh, for any, any RG flow. The errors, so when we when we wrote psi r o u v psi r prime as uh, delta r r prime plus some errors, these errors are basically controlled by e to the power of minus s minus, so this is supported on a, log of a delta. Now, in holography, what we have is that the moment your encoded information outside of the uh, corresponding entanglement wedge, you get exact error correction, right? So you don't need a gap here. You don't need a dis distance. You don't need to be far away from the RT region so that you have your approximate error correction gets better and better. So how is that? What does that say? It says that for any, oops, sorry. For any value of S minus log of A, this should be teeny tiny. It means that this is only possible if this delta is very, very large. So you need a large gap. So let me, let me clarify the situation. So in holography, we're dealing with a system with a large gap. There are heavy, uh, this is the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. Oops, sorry. There are heavy operators, the spectrum of the Hamiltonian in the language of conformal uh, dimensions, right? There are, there are heavy operators and then there are light operators. You could first ask if you encode something here and perturb, use any heavy operator here, whether you could correct such heavy operators. The answer to that, how good of an approximation you have is controlled by this delta, the gap that's correct, that separates the low energy states, light states from UV uh, heavy stringy states. And we know that this is large. So this argument that I just told you for approximate error correction in holography argues why stringy heavy perturbation on the boundary will be correctable in the bulk. So this is step one and is the argument is very solid. And then this is the step that actually holds in any uh, um, any renormalization group flow, no, whether it's geometric or not, is it always holds. Now the second step is more is trickier. That's and that's unique to holography. Not only you should be able to protect against the heavy operators inserted here, but also in holography we also have protection against light operators inserted here. This is the step that re standard renormalization doesn't have, and you need the large n factorization. To argue for it. But hopefully uh, the, the distinction is, is clear that there are two there are two two parallel arguments, two separate arguments at work. One of them will tell you that, well, by the very nature of the fact that you have large gap in holography, you should expect that no 
UV heavy heavy operate deformation heavy UV operator on the boundary could disturb the infrared bulk data. The thing that's more large n is this the role of the error correction for light operators. So what is what is neat about this story is that it actually makes a large n and large gap the, the role in the error correction a little bit more clear. Maybe I should I should stop here um, and um, summarize. So in summary, uh, what 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 I argued for is that there is a connection uh, between renormalization group and approximate error correction called approximate error correction, both at the classical and the quantum level. And this connection is very, very general. In this connection, the code states are low energy states. The errors are short distance UV operators. And uh, we, we explored this in classical Ising model. Uh, we, we argued for it. And then for in Simira, we can explicitly work it out with details of what are the errors. Then we see that there are consequences for holography. And this way of thinking about stuff tells us what is the role of large N and large, what are the roles of roles of large n and large gap in the emergence of exact error correction code. What we haven't done and what we are working on right now is how to uh, modify this, this story to uh, adjust for uh, approximate error correction codes and uh, the, the story of the distinction between the reconstructable wedge and uh, the entanglement wedge. But actually in the in our paper from in this uh, in our paper from December, we already have some discussions of the uh, that included in the paper. Anyway, um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks for the nice talk, Nima. Um, yeah, I think it's time to take more questions. Um, so this uh, gap delta that you were uh, mentioning, uh, is this, uh, is there any way, so I understand that this is the gap between the low energy states and the high energy states, uh, but is there a way to link this to the uh, conformal scaling factor of uh, a CFT operator? The conformal, sorry, uh, So like the conformal dimension of an oper of a CFT yeah, operator. It is, it is the conformal dimension of the operator. Yeah, no, it is, it is the conformal dimension of the operator because remember, what what are these, what is the coefficient that sits? Uh, um, so I think you mentioned that you have like some map phi and then phi of delta x equals. Uh, exactly. Delta x. Okay, so it's it's exactly the same thing, right? Um, yeah, this is, this is the, the thing that controls it. It's the dimension of the lightest primary. Why is the dimension of the lightest primary? Because it's the minus log of the smallest non-zero eigenvalue Sorry, non I the, the largest eigen non non ident non non oh god is is this so no, yeah um it's, no. it's log of this guy mm -hmm. but the the smallest log that you get minus log that you get and these are these are conformal primaries so the the gap we're discussing is actually gap even though I drew it as Hamiltonian but because I'm I'm thinking of holography again Hamiltonian and uh, Scaling operators are the same thing, right? Yeah, cool. Um, uh, I got you. Um, so uh, if you take something like Mira, um, uh, so uh, okay, let's forget Mira for a moment. Um, if you take like a regular CFT and you wanted to calculate something like a two-point correlation function, that's like one over the position between two spatially yeah. separated points to the uh two times uh, delta, yeah. where delta is your uh conformal uh, CFT dimension. So. Uh, can you get something equivalent in uh, Mira? Uh, can you get? Can you calculate like something like a two-point correlation function where this delta of the gap of the Hamiltonian is equivalent to the coefficient that appears in the difference between two spatially separated sites? I I, I think yeah, the calculation should not be too complicated. But I mean, um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We, we, we didn't include those calculations in our paper, the paper that we wrote, but so there's a there's a nice paper of uh, Giffray and a collaborator, I do not remember the name of unfortunately, where they looked at this model, um, this, this example of Simira, and they look at the correlation functions at various scales. And basically, the, if the, what you're asking is that whether there is some sort of an error correction a story we could write down for that calculation. 
And I think the answer is yes, but we didn't write it down. But do you have any intuition of like what it would represent, for instance? Um, what it uh, would you represent? Uh, like what is what would a two point correlation function mean in something like Miro uh, or in, in the language of error correction? Um, so, OK, so let's see. Um, yeah, so the two point correlation function, uh, let's so let's say one point is here, another point is here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So this is basically, um, yeah, it's an overlap calculation, right? So it's just sort of like you're saying that here, here is one, you use, you, you take the vacuum, you, you consider some sort of a, you encode something here and then you encode something farther out here. And then you look at the overlap of these guys. Yeah. And, um, and that should be like one over Y minus X to the two Delta basically. If yes. You, if you wanted to replicate like uh, the actual two point correlation functions of an actual. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe I should say this. Maybe, maybe the confusion that that's, uh, is caused by the, the following fact that if you do have an, uh, if you do have a, um, so when you, when you flow in the, when you flow in, um, uh, in RG, right? When you re reach the fixed point, that's when all your, the operators that remain are the scaling operators, right? Basically, that, that's yeah. all that has yeah. remained. Yeah. Everything yeah. else has dropped, yeah. right? So now, um, yeah, this, this has already simplified your problem a little bit. Because in CMIRA, the, the example that I gave you is not exact conform. There are relevant information, and the theory is becoming non conformal right? That was, that was important in the story. Um, uh, it's becoming non conformal Okay, so I, I guess yeah, what you're is, saying is that if you want to Poincaré invariance, it's breaking Poincaré invariance, not even like. Okay, so, so I guess what you're trying to say is that if you wanted to calculate some two point correlation functions, the spatial separation between the two points in Mira has to be restricted such that it's not larger than the size of the correctable region, right? Otherwise, you it's beyond uh, like then you no longer have conformal symmetry, right? Well, I, you don't need the conformal symmetry here, right? Like what, what you what you need is that you're just saying that there there. Well, okay, so I mean, you would need the conformal symmetry for calculating the two point correlation functions, right? In the example that I gave you, it's not conformal, and I can just exactly diagonalize it, right? So of course you might say, oh, if you're cheating, you're looking at an integral example. But we explored this in an integral example, which you know, I, I didn't really need. So may, maybe what you're asking is that, do we have a formulation of this that generalizes to some arbitrary perturbation for like a fixed point? Uh, and no, we do not understand those situations. For the same reason, the CMIRA has never been formulated, to my knowledge, a way, a, 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 non perturbatively away from, um, from uh, integrable points. Um, I see. Okay. Sort of same sort of problem. I mean, we're not solving. We're not coming up with a brand new formulation of Simira. We're just saying that the Simira that people have done could be interpreted as an error correction code. Mm -hmm. but I think the problem still exists. Like if I have a CFT that's generic, we, we I have no idea how to even go about doing uh, this. Maybe that maybe my my knowledge of this is not up to date, and there have been progress recently. But the the stories that I'm familiar with. Uh, there is the uh, continuum CTNR, I think, tensor network normalization. There is uh, there are a whole bunch of different stories, uh, but none of them really, at least to my knowledge, has accomplished a full non perturbative formulation of real space renormalization in the continuum limit. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, uh, is there some intuition why? Uh, CMIRA only works for integrable models and not non-integrable models, though. Well, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the wrong person to ask. I think Pavel might know a lot more about this because, uh, yeah, I think, I, um, let's see. Let me, let me see if I can um, say something. Well, it's just, it's just simply the fact that there, for, for an interacting theory, 
or non integral non perturbative uh, thing, we don't really know how to relate real space to um, real real space to energy, right? So in these free theories, what's good is that what's good is that low energy means long wavelength. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay? So that that's what's neat about this. But when you're talking about a fully non non perturbative uh, RG flow. I don't, that one, one of the places that I get stuck is um, very basic questions at that level. I don't even know how to go about doing this properly. Mm -hmm. I see, okay. Cool, thank you. Okay. I have a quick question, uh, Nima. Um, yes. If you go down to can the summary. Can you speak up? Can you please speak up? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me better now? Yes, yes, yes. yes. OK. Um, I just wanted to know quickly, um, so the arguments that you presented here do, I mean, maybe this is a, maybe a fatal complication, but I, I wanted to ask it anyway, is um, do you expect that these same arguments would hold for more general CFTs, not just like a unitary CFT? Oof. Um, so, short answer, I do not know. But let me see if I can say something. The, the, reason, the reason why I asked is because you said uh, up earlier when you were talking about Kim and Castellano's work, um, you were you had this um, yeah, equation that's where you... Yeah. Sorry? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, you had this equation where you wrote down the scaling super operator of a typical Mera, and you wrote down that this um, there's some dependency on the lightest operator, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, and so this just immediately got me thinking like, okay, what happens if your CFT is non-unitary, right? So, uh, yeah, I think, I think here the key idea is that the, the core idea is the mirror. Why, why do we even care about Mira? Most of what I say is, I don't even need to talk about Mira. I'm talking about Mira for, to be specific. But what matters is that if you model your renormalization group as a CPTP map, a quantum channel, right? That's what matters. When you model the quantum, when you model renormalization as a C, uh, quantum channel, it pops out immediately that the dimension of conformal primaries have to be non-negative. Now, if I have a non-unitary, that's, that's usually considered to be a unitarity constraint, right? So I suspect if you have a non-unitary theory, you have no reason to stick to, to believe that your RG is uh, a quantum channel. As a matter of fact, so there are nice formulations of uh, RG non-perturbatively by actually Pavel has worked on them, Tadashi, friends, a lot of people, but often the problem with those and this language is that often they are non-unit, they're not quantum channels. What's neat about Mira is that it's a quantum channel. So boom, you get this, these conditions, right? Um, yeah, so that what we're definitely using uh, quantum channels here. If, if not, yeah, you need, you need brand new arguments. Yeah, sorry, I, I forgot about that restriction. Thank you for clarifying. Sure. Maybe I can ask one last question. Um, sure. so, so when I saw your uh, this overlapping, uh, when you choose the the IR state but some UV operator, this somehow reminds me of um, of the Eigen state thermalization formulation. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Um, do you want to comment a bit on, on the relation between this part and uh, that one? Very good. Very, very good. Okay, uh, lovely, good. Yes, um, I'm, I'm happy to say things, and there are lots of caveats. So we originally had planned to write a whole section about this in our paper, but then last minute we dropped it because it sort of made the story ugly. But as I said, we don't know non perturbatively how to formulate formulate real space RG, right? We, we, I don't, I don't have any understanding of that. But a very, very simple idea 
is to say, well, what you want to do with non-perturbative G is that you want to suppress the UV modes. Well, do that by some sort of E to minus epsilon H. Apply E to minus epsilon H. I think this, this idea is pretty old, but explicitly Tadashi and Franz talked about this at some point uh, back in 2015, I think. Um, so what does it mean? It means that if you have this line and you create an operator here, you create a state by inserting an operator in Euclidean path integral, pushing this operator deeper earlier in Euclidean time is some notion of RG, right? So what, what we're saying is that, okay, so is there error correct? Are there error correction properties here? Of course there are. This is actually pretty straightforward. You could argue that there are error correction properties here. So if you insert an operator here, what controls this guy, right? Is this distance sort of. And operator state, uh, sorry, eigenstate normalization hypothesis is the extreme version of this when you push, push these guys to infinity. You create energy eigenstates and then you ask about local perturbations. So that's even like, that, that's the best case scenario in a sense. You, you don't even need to push that. So yeah, I think I think this was something that we talked about in our one of the argument uh, ETH papers that I wrote with uh, Tolia and uh, Hong. Uh, Hong Liu was about how you don't really need to go to eigenstates. We just need to insert these operators far enough in the Euclidean time. They have to suppress the UV modes enough. I see. That, I that's see. all that you really need. Um, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, there's, a, but th this is the context, you know, like this is, this is not modeling. Um, this is not a model of RG, which is described by a quantum channel. You still see, you still see the approximate error correction here, but not, it's not because of eigen, eigen values of quantum channel. Okay, that's great. I feel so. You are saying actually this epsilon here plays the role of the RG flow in. in it's a, it's a, it's in, an, the I, in my opinion, in my humble humble opinion, it's an oversimplified model of RG. So there is, you know, there is. I, I think at the end of the day, RG. There's no unique way to do RG, right? So you need a bunch of criteria, and there's always a compromise between how many of these criteria you satisfy and how explicit of a map do you get. So this is an example where you've written a map that is not really satisfying a lot of the properties that you want, but you, it's super explicit. You have the tools of Euclidean path integrals to compute. Now it's not my favorite map because it's not. Um, it's not really following, it doesn't have all the uh, features that I would like, whereas Mira is very explicit. But then, you know, you, you, it's, a, it's a compromise. Okay, probably I need to think more, but yeah, this, um, this is a nice explanation. Yeah, thanks a lot. Sure. Um, I guess probably that's uh, all for today. So thank you again. I will stop the recording now.